So hello, I'm Amy Castor. I'm an independent reporter and we are here in Lisbon where IOHK is having its annual company summit. Uh, and I am joined here today by Robert Veglione, uh, co-founder of Zencash, mm -hmm. and Charles Hoskinson, who is the CEO of IOHK. And the reason we have them both here together is because uh, Zencash and IOHK have entered into a research partnership and we're going to learn a little bit more about what that is. It involves a treasury system and implementing what's called a directed acyclic graph protocol. Um, so, Charles, <laughs> do you want to start by telling us a little bit more? Is it a partnership? Is it a research partnership? What exactly is the relationship that IHK right. has with Zencash? Mm -hmm. Right. So it's important to understand the history uh, and how we got to where we're at. So uh, it started um, last year when I had a chance to meet Rob and his wife and Rolf and many others uh, on the Zencash team. And we really, really enjoyed talking to them, working with them, uh, basically just answering questions uh, such as, you know, how do you grow a cryptocurrency? How do you grow a community? Where should the science go? Uh, where should the development go? And so forth. So they invited me to be an advisor and, mm -hmm. of course, accepted because I thought it would be uh, awesome to collaborate with them. It's a pretty good decision. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. And actually, we've already had a heck of a lot of fun. And uh, Rob has gone all around the world chasing us about. I, I think <laughs> Ukraine and uh, now here in Portugal. I'll take what I can get. Well, there we yeah, are, you know. Yeah, there we go. And so, so that was a, that was fun. So then, uh, then we started opening up some discussions about going beyond an advisory role mm -hmm. and um, helping Zencash figure out where it wants to be as a, as a cryptocurrency, in particular on the research side. One of our core competencies as an organization is our ability to, to spec out from business requirements or real life problems where does the science need to be to actually verify that these things get solved. Mm -hmm. So there are things like how do you make Zencash uh, a currency that uh, has a very high throughput and could actually be used as a cash? You know, mm -hmm. can actually be used for 10,000, 20,000 transactions per second over an arc of time and be useful in the, in the browser setting and other things like that. There are things like how do we enhance and grow the privacy guarantees upon which Zencash is constructed and also how do we make Zencash more sustainable as a protocol. So these are things like treasury uh, components and so forth. Mm -hmm. And these are areas that IOHK as a company is, is quite interested in and we have a research agenda for. Uh, but we as a company don't pursue intellectual property, we don't pursue patents, and most of our work is done within the academic circles, so these are papers. So there's no reason why this can't be shared or in some cases um, custom uh, localized for particular projects like Zencash. So we were really keen to, to collaborate. The other thing is that Zencash already has a treasury system. It's a system that needs to be upgraded and evolved over oh. time. but. We, uh, we wanted to do a, uh, a deal where we, instead of working with a company or a person, we were working with a cryptocurrency, with a blockchain. Mm -hmm. right? It's our first client like that, and we, we hope to have many, many more. So that was kind of the, the spirit of the initial agreement. Uh, so we, uh, we negotiated something out, and it, uh, we were just getting started. Now, so, so want to add to that, or? so 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 part of the partnership is implementing a treasury system, right? Right. Uh, and and I understand that um, they'll be using the the same version of the protocol that's been developed by OHK's researcher uh, Ben Cheng. Right. Zheng. Well, that yeah. That, so so he's building out the theory. So he's uh -huh. saying, well, what does voting need to look like, and what are some of the security properties you need to hold, and what are some of the game theoretic uh, things that you have to worry about? Right. Right. So that's kind of like the model. Then, once you have that model, there's a question of what does that model mean for Cardano? What does that model mean for Ethereum Classic? What does that model mean for Zencash? And that's part of what we have to figure out once the model is constructed, because it's going to be parameterized likely differently. So, so let me ask Rob, I mean, yeah. what does that entail? Um, you're going to be implementing a prototype of, of, of the, this treasury implementation in the first quarter, the second quarter of 2018? Is that yeah, so the prototype we think will be will be ready in this, by probably the end of second quarter, uh -huh. uh, if everything goes according to plan. In terms of implementing it, that will be the next step. So we'll, we'll, okay. we'll receive the prototype and we'll make sure that it's spec, you know, well for our system, and then we'll move it to implementation and then production after that. Okay, so I mean, like, yeah. when do you think we'd have like a fully implementing implemented treasury system on Zencash? I mean, that's that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, th this is purely, uh, you know pre, you yeah. know, just kind of early thought, but I would say probably by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. will this be like the first, I mean, there are other treasury systems mm -hmm. we know with like um, um, Dash is implementing a treasury system, okay. Decred is some kind of treasury system. 
um, where there's actual voting um, and and taxing the um, should we have explained what a treasury system is briefly? Yeah, we can we can explain that. Sure. Um, well, just like briefly, that it sure. is both a, both it's it involves uh, voting. First, there's the taxation of the system where they take right. about a ten percent of the mining reward. Or, yeah, we can get into that. So you have three sources. Uh, so first off, what is the point of a treasury system? It, the the long term goal is permanent sustainability. Mm -hmm. So imagine a cryptocurrency like a government. And a government is a collection of departments, and each department does something. So when Bitcoin was established, you had one compensated department, and everything else was volunteer. Yeah. So for consensus, that's the mining side, totally paid for, great. Mm -hmm. But for moving network messages, for doing development, for doing marketing, for setting up companies, for evangelizing, all these things, completely volunteer and not compensated. Mm -hmm. So people like Dash, BitShares, uh, Decred, Pivx, and Cash, others, have adopted the philosophy that maybe some of these other buckets need some fair share funding as well from wherever this funding comes from. So then the next question is where does that come from and then who gets to decide? Mm -hmm. Those are the two other questions. So you have three ways you can fill that bucket. One way is through inflation. So mm -hmm. you just print more money. That's what Bitcoin does to pay miners, you know, block rewards. So it started at 50 and then it went to 25 and now it's 12 and a half and it decreases by a factor of two every four years. Another way is to take a proportion of transaction fees. So instead of taking all the transaction fee and giving it to the miner, you take a percentage of it, you put it into that bucket. Or another way is donations, mm -hmm. where people just put money right. in. The problem with donations is while they're the purest form and they're the most consensual, the issue is that they tend to be inconsistent and unreliable. The right. problem with transaction fees is that they tend to be not enough to sustain the system unless you have huge scale system with tons of stuff going on. So generally inflation is the predominant model. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like in practice? Usually what you do is you say, okay, instead of giving 20 coins or 30 coins per block to the miner, we're going to give 16 coins or 24 coins to the miner. We're going to take that small sliver that we don't mm -hmm. and put it into that bucket. Okay. But this is what I mean by parameterization. Sure. So we, when we construct out this model, we, we say, okay, here's how the voting works. Here's how the treasury ballot system works. But those parameters of what where the, the filling of that bucket mm -hmm. comes from is tunable. And that's a decision Zencash okay. gets to make and Ethereum can make and right. Cardano can make and well, so forth. Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, oh. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't Zencash go ahead and Im implement something a little bit simpler? Why are you taking mm -hmm. this, you know, broad spec to well, do something? They've like already liquid? done that. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's exactly liquid, right. But, but but why are you taking the step up then to liquid democracy? Yeah, oh, we think that that's just the future, and that's the way these systems should go because the the current models are just very inefficient. Uh -huh. You know, so we want to constantly improve, and we just have this empirical mentality of, you know, kind of put something on the mar out there, uh -huh. you know test it, see, get feedback from the market, from the system, see how they're performing, and then try to improve them and constantly improve them. Right. So what we found here when we, when we first read uh, that IOHK white paper for the treasury mm -hmm. system, blown away. Because really? this is just a very elegant implementation of our core technology with zero knowledge cryptography mm -hmm. and a game theoretic framework that improves and optimizes voting systems. Mm -hmm. So this may not be the final system that you know we have as an industry, but this is a huge step up, kind of like a, a step function jump up in technology, you know, and mingling technology with economics, and I think in a way that will be very impressive for the market. And, and for IOHK, it gives you a chance to kind of test out this protocol in a real world situation the right. first time it'll be used in a cryptocurrency? Yeah, well, we plan on putting it in Cardano as well, and our hope is to turn this into the IOHK reference treasury model. Um, so we're going to put it into many different cryptocurrencies, ideally. I look at these things like the mechanisms of governance. I don't think that should be a competitive differentiator for mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. I don't think we should look at and say, oh, well, you know, Dash has this or Decred has this. Of course, there's going to be differences, but ultimately they should be using best available tools. Mm -hmm. And then it should be other factors that, uh, that determine whether the cryptocurrency is successful or not. So in my view, I'd like to build the best governance model I can think of with the best people and get it in as many cryptocurrencies as possible because that overall increases the overall amount of funding available for research, for development, and for growth. So does that, does that mean that this is going to be like an open source protocol, this yep. treasury system, that any right. of the cryptocurrencies can go and just kind of grab out of a bucket and right. put it into their, yeah, their platform? Exactly. And that's, that's what we've done with prior projects. For example, we worked on the Scorex project for, I think, now more than two years and we continue our commitment. And Scorex is a modular open source framework for building cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And it's already been used in several projects, the most notable of which is Waves, 
-hmm. or they forked it and they put their own magic into it and now it's, a, it's something that's floating around the space. So similarly, I'd love to do the same thing is to create a treasury framework wow. mm -hmm. and then other people can take that and build on top Th of it. That's but, a really interesting concept. I don't know that I've heard anything quite like that before. Right. Um, but but so, so basically all the cryptocurrencies, all these projects should be kind of keeping their eye on Zencash to seeing mm -hmm. how this works in case they may want to implement uh, a treasury system right. in the future, and it, it sounds like it would make so much more sense to, it's it's open source, why not take this one mm -hmm. and use that rather than right. starting from scratch and doing your own, right? And it's battle tested, and, uh, right. and also it's, and it's this got is some the first peer battle. reviewed research. Yeah. This is the first yeah. battle, right? One of the first, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it, it takes transparency and just kind of like good ethics to the next level in this industry, and I think right. that's something we really have to start self-policing, uh -huh. and when you have a system that kind of Dissociates, you know, the, the funding allocations from the decisions of specific people. So mm -hmm. it makes these systems just much more fair, honest, mm -hmm. transparent. And then you have to wonder why would other projects not adopt them? Right. 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 Because then this is almost kind of like a signaling equilibrium in the market, where you can see projects that are taking this, you know, hyper transparency route with things being kind of more systematized and, right. and fair. And then you have other projects that remain opaque right. and kind of have discretionary authority over funding allocations. You wonder why. Well, why, right. why wouldn't a project want to do something like a treasury system? Because it, it's so difficult to get, um, uh, you know, VC funding. You're always right. worried about mm -hmm. whether the VC is going to have some con say, something to say over the project. Yeah. And ICOs, well, we've seen what kind of problems those have. and right. Nobody knows what's going to happen with the regulations. And if you get donations, well, um, you, you just can't really count on that, you know? Right. right. It's like public radio. <laughs> you always have to go. <laughs> well, you can, you can always have your, your telethon and hire your Jerry. Your telethon, yeah. right. You have to go well, to actually, telethon. Like Jerry Lewis, Come yeah. on, everybody get I'll on the phone right now fine. so we can keep you know, Zen Cash going right. or whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's some good <laughs> practical reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. A, a because... Um, First, maybe you don't believe the technology is there, or B, you can't figure out how to balance economic mm -hmm. incentives. Mm -hmm. right. The biggest thing in all of these types of governance models is that voting is difficult, democracy is difficult. It's, uh, you have to have an incentive to participate. Right. There's this idea called rational ignorance. It's well understood in the economic circles where the cost of becoming informed on something mm -hmm. is more than the value you gain from being informed. Right. Mm -hmm. So the rational action is to stay ignorant on that issue. Right. So if you look at the United States, for example, we have these really complicated things like Medicare and Social Security and the federal budget and foreign policy. And, and you can literally go get a PhD and spend your entire career studying just one of those things, more accurately one dimension of one of those things because mm -hmm. they're multidimensional. And the vote you get is identical to the crazy hobo on the side of the street that thinks right. aliens are coming tomorrow. Right. right. So when you have a system that incentivizes at that level outside of altruism, there is no reason to actually invest a reasonable amount of time to become informed of these types of things. Right. So what ends up happening is people tend to vote for irrational reasons. They tend to not vote at all. And so participation tends to go down and quality of participation mm -hmm. tends to go down. So, so basically, mm -hmm. and I've been reading about this a bit too, and I think, right. I think this is part of what you're mm -hmm. saying, that, that, that the two biggest challenges in implementing a voting system are one, getting incenting people to vote. Right. They have to have some kind of desire or, right. or, or get paid or something back for that. Oh, there's all kinds of things. It's not just about who gets to vote. It's also right. about what do you get to vote on. An example I love to give, the fact that we were at Nexus Conf together in Aspen, yeah. and I did a presentation there, and I said, well, how many people here voted for either Hillary or Trump? And some people raised their hands, yeah. and I said, how many people here wish they had more choices than just Hillary or Trump? And everybody raised yeah. their hand, regardless <laughs> of their political affiliation. Yeah. So it's less about uh, who gets to vote, and also you have to consider mm -hmm. What do you get to vote on? Right. Like, how do you actually get on the ballot? Mm -hmm. Who gets to decide what gets on the ballot and what, what doesn't get on the ballot? Because right. uh, it, it, that, that in itself has a profound impact on the outcome of the election. So you need to think about incentives very carefully, the voting class very carefully, the balloting process very carefully, and time of mm -hmm. deliberation very carefully as well. The problem with a lot of voting systems is mm -hmm. that we just say, go make a decision, here you go. But in some cases, it needs to be a very slow, deliberate system. Well, well let me ask. Let me ask. Let me let me ask you this: yeah. What kind of things are you going to be voting on? Yeah. So I mean, it, we do have a path in mind for ultimately. Like, even goes back to the question of why are we doing this? All right. For because there's always this trade-off between centralization and decentralization, right? If you if you had God making all decisions and this was an omniscient, you know, omnipotent you know, entity that could just do everything perfectly, 
you would want that, right? But we don't have that. We have human beings who are imperfect, so we decentralize. And for us, it's extremely important to decentralize because we want to be censorship resistant. Right. Right. So that's a whole part. That's of, why the that's a whole part of the theme of Zencash yeah. is being censorship yeah. resistant. And and we didn't talk about it earlier, but you have this entire this messaging system where, you know, people can send secure private messages right. totally. back and forth. So we don't have situations like what we just saw in Iran where they 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 block Telegram. Right. Um, because of peaceful, peaceful protests. Exactly. And, and so that's why we're willing to right. take the resource, you know, it, 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 this is resource intensive to do right. this kind of thing. And we have trade-offs and we know that we're getting some inefficiencies, but we're making what we think is a more open, fair system that's censorship resistant. And mm -hmm. we, we know that there's some wisdom in crowds and there's also some irrationality in crowds, right? right? Like Charles just mentioned. So we're trying to create a balanced system and we're doing this incrementally. So initially what we're doing, like I view governance in two, almost two stages. You've got resource allocation and then you've got parameter adjustments, mm -hmm. right? Who determines the, the next hard fork and what goes right. into it? We're tackling the easier of those two problems right now, which is the funding allocation. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we have a treasury fund for governance and we're just determining a better way to implement. Like. Right. So, so let's touch on the, the second aspect of this research partnership mm -hmm. between Zencash and IOHK, and mm -hmm. that is, 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 which is really interesting to me, is because I, I haven't heard a lot about this, but you're implementing the, um, the, the Spectre protocol. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. a protocol we, we might implement. It depends upon, at the end of the day, the research development, the, the Zencash team's opinion, the community's opinion, but that's the, probably the best of the, of the group that we've seen to start with yeah. in a really rigorous inquiry. So why do we want to implement something this, or what's the need? So one of the easiest ways to get higher throughput and performance with a proof of work system is to take your block interval and reduce the block interval. That means you make more blocks in a shorter period of time, mm -hmm. which means you have more throughput, you have more transactions per second. Mm -hmm. So why didn't Satoshi do this? I mean, he created Bitcoin and he set the original block interval of 10 minutes, so why didn't he choose four minutes or one minute or 30 seconds? Well, the problem is that the smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller that you make that block interval, the higher the probability you have what's called an orphan block. Mm -hmm. So what happens is Bob, who's a miner, will discover a block, but right around the same time, Alice, who's a miner, will discover her own block. And so this group of the network, because they saw that block first, think Alice's block is right. Mm -hmm. And this group of the network, because they saw the uh, block first, think Bob's block is right. So now you have fork. You have two versions of the chain, and we're not quite sure which version of history is right. Mm -hmm. So how Satoshi resolves this is he said, ah, okay, we're going to have a competition, and whichever one of these forks gets a block built on top of it, that becomes the legitimate chain. And the other one is discarded. It's called an orphan block, so that block goes away. Okay, well, here's the problem. That reduces the efficiency of your system because you now have all these wasted resources on this thread, right. everybody who worked there, so you've gotten less security amongst other theoretical and practical problems. Mm -hmm. So what if you could build a protocol where it's okay to have lots of these things and they get included in the blockchain mm -hmm. and they have some sort of relationship to what ends up being the longest chain, but it doesn't slow things down. It doesn't damage throughput or security. So this was a line of research that started in Israel under two people, Avi Zohar and Yonatan Samopinsky. What year did that come out? And uh, the first paper was called Ghost, and it came out in 2013. And actually, we included Ghost, a uh, version of it, in the Ethereum protocol. Mm -hmm. So later on, what they did is they built up the theory, they built up the rigor, and they created a new version of the protocol called Spectre, which came out in 2016. Right. And uh, they've been since iterating and refining and thinking carefully about the model. And there's likely going to be several commercial products that end up putting are there, uh, Spectre. Is, are there any cryptocurrencies right now that are implementing the, the, the now this is a dicrylic, I, I never directed say it right, a directed a, a, yeah. a cyclic graph, we'll just right. call it a DAG. Yeah. But, but, and there are different, there are different versions of that, mm -hmm. right? right? I mean, I think there's hash Graph and, and iota, iota with tangle yeah. and, and yeah. biota b bite ball right but they're not implementing the spectre protocol. no and that's, that's a very something different, protocol. different right yeah. right so the one that you're working on like what exactly is uh, IOHK doing in terms of the Spectre protocol? So, like, are you just so, seeing the feasibility of implementing so it? So there's a, there's a collection of things that have to be done. So the first thing that we have to do is read the paper very carefully. <laughs> yeah. It's not an easy yeah. paper. There's 40 pages of math proofs in right. there. It's, <laughs> so, it's, not, a, yeah. it's not an easy <laughs> paper. It's, it's, so, then, so then we have to extract yeah. from that paper some form of an engineering specification. And then what we have to do is a trade-off analysis mm -hmm. and say if 
the Zencash engineers were to implement this, this is what you're giving up and this is what you're gaining. Right. These are the security guarantees that you can reasonably have. These are the performance enhancements you're going to get, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So that trade-off profile has to be generated and specification has to be generated. That's understandable by so engineers. So this is, I mean, this is like a big deal. A lot of people don't understand. Like somebody writes a paper and they've got an idea and they've got these mathematical specifications for it, but turning that into an actual piece of software is that you can implement is, is a gigantic right. step, Especially right? if it's a very complex right. paper that hasn't been simplified a lot. If you look at the right. Bitcoin white paper, it's very small, yeah. it's very concise, yeah. and it's a very simple idea. Yeah. Spectre is like this super complex and really involved, really yeah. deep and detailed paper that was written from the perspective of a mathematician, mm -hmm. not from an engineer. So it's mathematically elegant. It has a, a high degree of, of confidence that there's some correctness there, but it's not something you could hand to a programmer and say, go, right. go build but this. That, but I mean, this is what IHK is doing. You're, you're taking this 40-page paper and, and you're turning into something that uh, is... Uh, like specified, yeah. Specified. Yeah. That we, you're actually right. going to specify it and, and formally verify it? And, and not a formal verification. That's a bit beyond the right. initial scope. The first step is just let's write a semi-formal specification that an engineer can read that doesn't require grokking 40 pages of yeah. math proofs. Uh, and, and then what Rob gets to do is go to his people and say, does this make sense for us? Right. Or are there other DAG technologies that are maybe lighter weight or have better trade-off profiles than Spectre? And then we can do that same task for them. So, and then eventually they can pick one and we can help so them with that So that's the part I'm not sure about. So you're, yeah. you're developing the protocol that, that, that a cryptocurrency or project can implement. But, but what, so what role does Zencash play? In? They write the code. Oh, yeah. you're actually writing the code. Right, and we need to see if this protocol makes sense for us. Right. I mean, it, it's extremely fascinating. I would say this is the most fascinating protocol out so, there. Right. So, so for, IHK yeah. is specifying it, yeah. right? And right. then they pass it on to you, mm -hmm. and you are, Zencash is actually writing the code. Right. See, I didn't understand that before, right? right. That's pretty cool. Yeah. If we've done our so, job yeah. really, really well, then it should cool. be pretty straightforward for them yeah. to, to know how to do that kind of implementation. Mm -hmm. Also, there's going to be something you have to give up when you go from theory to practicality. Uh -huh. And there's a well, big back and forth discussion about what's reasonable to give up. Just like the parameterization of that treasury model, right. we can give them a framework, we can tell them all the theory, mm -hmm. but ultimately the Zencash team has to make a decision along with their community of what are those parameters going to be and what that profile is going to be. It's, it's not our decision to make, okay. it's their decision Got to it. make. So, yeah. so but, but I mean, what do you get out of... Uh, 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 Putting all that work into, you know, creating a DAG. I mean, is that something that you're really serious about implementing? I Ten, mean, tens of thousands is... of transactions per second. Really? Yeah. Low latency, uh, confirmation times. Yeah. Uh, it's basically like an order of magnitude performance. If Maybe several. Yeah, so right. I'm saying, yeah. Exactly. Uh, performance improvement. Yeah, I mean, th this takes us, uh, we, we, all we, we call ourselves Zencash, and across the industry we talk about being used as an alter alternative currencies, but the reality is most of these systems don't scale very well, they don't have high transaction throughput, right. there are issues, right? Right. Even even now, we have a fairly active chain, we, we have a good amount of transactions already on there for a project that's seven months old, we're right. already surpassing a lot of m more mature projects, and we're already starting to kind of bump up against some, every now and then, we, we hit blocks, they're like, wow, th this is kind of slow, kind right. of packed, you know, right. we, we, we know we have to make this like two, three order magnitude jump in, wow. in an ability if it, we're going to be taken seriously as a transaction mechanism. So just so, so people understand, this is like, this is like a big problem that yeah. all, all blockchains, all right. cryptocurrencies face is this scalability right. issue. And um, a lot of people are working on a lot of different ideas on how to fix that. So this right. is, this is kind of, this is really interesting. The way, that, oh, the, oh. the way that I see scalability right now in the industry yeah. is a lot of projects are looking at parameter changes, which are kind mm -hmm. of like linear scaling solutions. Right. This would be kind of like a, an exponential scaling solution. Linear, which or is, else they're doing things off yeah. chain where they want yeah. to take and, and, then, yeah. and then use the blockchain to settle on. But, right. but, but now this is like a completely different concept. Right. And the one thing that I still don't understand, and this may be really too technical to get into here, is but there is a big difference between the Spectre protocol and... Uh, the existing DAG protocol that's being implemented in, in, in the three other projects we mentioned, right? Yeah, and, and, and Spectre is kind of fine-tuned for proof of work, whereas IOTA and uh, Hashgraph is not. Okay. So, so that's one of the... You know, Spectre was made with uh, an attempt to improve Bitcoin-like systems in mind. Wow. Right? So when you reduce block interval, how do we get more blocks out of that? And right. it's okay to have orphan blocks wow. and we can have paths of things. Wow, that's whereas very IOTA is like a completely different notion of mm -hmm. how, how this ought to work. 
which is less understood and not really rigorously reviewed as, mm -hmm. as much as what we've seen with proof of work. Right. So the hope is that we can reuse many of the security guarantees that proof of work has already provided, but just get these orders of magnitude yeah. performance so, improvements. So just again, like you, it, it, you're still going to have your, your proof of work because we know yeah. that Zencash is yeah. based on Zcash, which is based on Bitcoin. Right. So it uses that sort of basic Bitcoin right. Uh, code and 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 the the proof of work well equihash yeah so th this is a big thing for me is you know like the, the big difference here like Charles said it's mo it's really tailored for proof of work systems so we still have blocks it's just the blocks are arranged in a DAG okay. you know, versus transactions right. being arranged into a DAG right I so. see yeah and so and so that's nice because anytime you can reuse prior results or prior security mm -hmm. Um, then you can usually drop in lots of cool theory there yeah. that uh, has been vetted and tested. When you're inventing new theory, that's a much more ambitious, uh, much much harder thing to do. Like for example, IOHK with its Ouroboros research agenda, we've invested now a year and a half into building this big lattice of theory uh, and all these papers, and we've been accepted at Eurocrypt and crypto and ACNS and financial crypto, but we spent literally millions of dollars and we're just now starting to get to a point where we have practicality in our mm -hmm. system. Whereas when you look at things like proof of work, there's nine years of history here. There's, there's a lot of good ideas that have been vetted and tested and proven, right. not only in the academic world, but also in empirically in, yeah. the, uh, in the cryptocurrency space as a whole. So we say, if we can just take something that's tested, tried and true, and put something like Spectre in, if we get that to work, well, then it's the best of both worlds. You get those performance improvements, but then you can still rely upon prior results. Another thing that's exciting is proof of work actually has certain characteristics which are very hard to replicate in proof of stake. We think we have ideas to do that in the Ouroboros research agenda. They'll take months to years to complete. But right now, we have papers, for example, our sidechains paper, non interactive proofs of proof of work. That's not only a good protocol for sidechains, that's a very good protocol for SPV clients. So basically, you can get light clients with equivalent levels of security or near equivalent levels of security as a full node, which is just currently not pos popular for a possible for any kind of system. Yeah. With this, uh, with sticking to proof of work, it's pretty straightforward how to drop a system like that into a uh, protocol, even if it had Spectre. Whereas if this was done with uh, a proof of stake system, it's like a original research thread. It'll take a year, maybe two years for us to, to see if it's even possible to emulate. So it's a lower risk, more pragmatic way of this approaching is, the problem. This is some really cool stuff. I mean, I'll <laughs> definitely be keeping an eye on uh, Zencash to right. see <laughs> well, how this... This is what, this is what I love work, about working with IOHK is if you look at this industry right now, most projects are just kind of hobby shops to just kind of throw something out there and see, they kind of see how it goes. IOHK takes a scientific approach to actually doing rigorous peer-reviewed research and then implementing it, mm -hmm. implementing incredible products. Mm -hmm. So this is something that the industry needs a lot more of. So working with these guys was a no-brainer for me. Oh, we I mean, like working is, with these yeah. guys. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of but fun. We need more of this, yeah. right? So this is really interesting. So you're going to be working on um, DAGs, Spectre mm -hmm. Protocol, and Treasuries. Mm -hmm. And what's the future? Any other collaborations between IOHK and Zencash? Yeah, so IOHK is recently entering, uh, entered the uh, SNARK space, and so we're very keen to do something interesting there. Uh, we have a, a center we're setting up at University of Edinburgh under uh, one of our research fellows named Markov Kolweis, wonderful guy, very smart. And uh, the lab's goal is to look at SNARKs uh, from the perspective of both verified computation as well as privacy. So we're quite interested in doing things like making them more efficient, uh, reducing the amount of size they have, getting rid of trusted setups wherever that's possible, right. these types of things. So I see a very natural potential future collaboration there. Right. But more abstractly, you know, it's not just Rob and I or Rolf, Rob and I or Zencash and IOHK even, it's more of a community thing where the Zencash community as a whole can say, hey, you know, the X, Y, and Z are really interesting to us. We'd love for you guys to get involved in that. We can potentially expand the relationship accordingly, which is what makes this so fun, is that that dynamicism and that back and forth that you get. So it's not always top down, it's more bottom up. Right. Great. Nice. Well, we'll be looking forward to that. ZK Snarks yeah. as well. Okay. Brilliant. Thank Thanks. you. Good talking to you both. <laughs>